pretty sure David's going to be here, but oh, he will be. Okay. Good morning, everybody. This is the May 28th, 2015 meeting of the City of Palo Alto's Historic Resources Board. Uh, Diana, would you like to take roll? Chair Cola. Here. Board Member McKinnon. Here. Vice Chair Bernstein. Here. Board Member Bowell. Board Member Bannenberg. Here. Board Member Dezekiel. Board Member Wimmer. Here. Thank you. Okay. Uh, staff is all here. Okay. Um, are there any oral communications? I've not seen any cards. Um, so I guess there's not. <clears throat> Agenda changes, additions, and deletions. My light's on. Yeah, it's really loud, isn't it? Yeah, okay. It sounds loud. <clears throat> um, no changes. Uh, any minutes? No minutes. Okay. So that brings us to the uh, first item, um, 262 Kingsley Avenue, request by Carl Hess of Square Three Design Studios on behalf of Michael and Eco Mize for uh, individual review and historic review for a proposal to demolish an existing two-car garage and rear portions of the existing home and construct a one-car garage and a two-story addition to the rear of the existing two-story home for a total of 2,909 square feet in the R1 10,000 square foot zoning district and the Professorville Historic District. Um, I was a early consultant on this project, so I need to step out for the meetings on this. Um, should. Uh just advise the board that um, if uh, Chair Kohler recuses himself, there is no longer a quorum. So um, might we suggest. Five. We have four members. Four. 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 Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. Can't count this morning. Yeah. And I'll go call Dave and tell him to get down here. So, okay. Thank you. I'll be next door if you need me. <laughs> We have a staff report on the project. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair McKinnon and board members. Uh, Matthew Weintraub, planner, uh, just provide a brief staff report. Um, the project at 262 Kingsley, the proposal is to um, uh, move the, the structure on the lot forward, um, construct a new second story rear addition, as well as a new detached garage um, and some other um, uh, improvements to the property. Um, staff is recommending approval with conditions um, the conditions relate to um, ensuring that there's uh, an appropriate ample front yard setback in order to maintain um, the pattern of, uh, of um, setbacks that are, that are on the street um, in terms of um, not necessarily a consistent pattern, but um, uh, some variation in front setbacks, um, as well as um, a condition that the, um, the proposed light well be re relocated further to the back of the property so that it is not uh, doesn't affect the integrity of the historic structure itself. Um, and um, also a recommendation that um, the uh, existing front door, which does appear to be a historic fabric, uh, should be retained as long as it's not uh, damaged or deteriorated. Um, and uh, thank you. I believe the applicant is here uh, to speak on the project. Thank you. Do we have, uh, is the owner present to wish to make a statement? If you would uh, please announce your name when you come to the podium so, for the record. Do I need to, is it working? Okay. <laughs> uh, my name is Carl Hess from Square 3 Design Studios. We're the architects for Mike and Eco Mies. And uh, yeah, I think the, the staff report that Matt put together covers the scope of the work very thoroughly. Uh, uh, the Mises bought the property roughly a year ago. We've been working with them to develop a remodel addition scheme. As uh, the report 
indicates there's an existing non-original two-car garage that we want to remove and uh, replace with a single car garage and be able to claim some of that square footage to put towards the house. There's a couple of old additions off the rear of the house that we want to remove and replace with a, a new two-story addition. The old additions are, are two stories. Um, and, and to you know, create that addition in such a way that complements the existing original architecture uh, more sensi uh, sensibly. Um, and as part of the project, uh, we're also proposing to uh, excavate a basement under the uh, entire house. And, uh, and in conjunction with that, we would like to move the house forward. It's currently set back about 30 feet, uh, where the front setback requirement is 20. And uh, from our analysis there on that side of the block, there's not a whole lot of houses, but um, the average, or, or that most of the front setbacks of the houses at front Kingsley there on that side are between 21 and 25 feet. This is the only one that's set back 30 feet. So we didn't quite agree with Matt on, on the, uh, there being a pattern. This is the one house that's sort of out of the pattern and we would like to bring it forward. We we're proposing to bring it, uh, I forget exactly now, seven feet, I think, forward. Um, and then that new front entry porch is, is uh, uh, brings it uh, a little bit closer. The proposed uh, new basement with uh, the light well that came up in question as a condition, uh, we felt we were very strategic in locating that light well on the opposite side of the house from the driveway, uh, in which there currently is and there would remain being a side fence or a fence between the house and the side property line, as is customary really all over town. And so that, uh, that light well wouldn't, would not be visible from really anywhere no. uh, except from within the property. And, and in, in our coordination with uh, uh, Matt and Christy during the uh, uh, design process and meetings with them, we originally had had the light well come all the way to the front corner of the existing house. Uh, we had since pushed that back three or four feet so it's just in front of the first window on the side so that the, um, the volume of the existing original part of the house, that front right corner was visible. Uh, and you'd, you'd see the wall turn the corner. You'd, you'd see the fence there uh, between the house and the side property line. And anything beyond that, of course, would be blocked from view. And of course, we're interested in, in keeping that light well the way we've designed it because of the functionality of the basement. If we, if we do have to eliminate that or push it back, it's going to uh, very much adversely affect the functionality of the, um, of the basement and being able to get natural light down into the uh, living spaces there. Um, uh, other than that, you know, the, uh, the items that Matt indicated in the report, um, uh, the, the front entry porch, we've expanded the front entry door. There is a, a comment about not, uh, or about yeah, preserving that existing door. We don't believe it's an original door. 
but if if that were uh, something that uh, you all felt strongly about, I think the owners are fine with that. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, Mike Meese is here and, and is uh, also uh, interested in saying a few words. Uh, yes, I had several questions, um, and one was, um, am I reading correctly that, that you propose to take off all of the shingles and replace them? The, I think it makes most sense for that to, to come off and be replaced, so they're replaced in a consistent manner. Um, and, and they all blend in together, you know, adequately or properly. It, yeah. And of course, new. But we would we would we would replace them with the same material, uh, the same exposure, uh, replicate. What's and there? Um, what about the um, the sort of color of the shingles? Because these shingles have a patina of more than a hundred years. <laughs> a lot of it is, which is probably dust. <laughs> um, uh, we, I, 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 I'm pretty confident that we can match that color, you know, paint it again. Uh, they're painted, they're not stained. That they would be painted yeah, rather than yeah. stained. They are painted now, it's a painted finish. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then I, uh, have some concern about loss of historic fabric, uh, including the shingles. Uh, and also, I didn't see uh, mention of the um, windows, the leaded uh, windows and, you know, in fact, the existing windows. The, the leaded windows are to remain. We're gonna repair them and probably, uh, I mean, they're, they're they're the complete opposite of energy efficient openings, uh, glazed openings. So our, our plan was to have them repaired, straightened out. I don't know if you've seen them, but they're pushed in, the glass is about ready to fall out in several places. But uh, uh, we were gonna have those repaired and then have a additional uh, a pain located, installed behind them to try to create a more uh, airtight situation there. But, but they, are, they, are, they will remain. And how will they be protected during all of this construction? The sashes will be removed um, from the frames and, and uh, protected on site. We'll actually have to send those to a, a shop to have them repaired. That, that would do the repair. Yeah. Okay. Um, and let's see. Now then, uh, looking at the Sanborn maps, I, I should uh, also divulge that I um, have uh, looked at this house several times, and uh, it. Uh, it uh, when you talk about the setback and that one house didn't match, which house was that that didn't, that you felt didn't match the um, 25? Th this house, the two, uh, our project is, is the one house that's set back 30 feet where uh, the others on this side of the street on this block are between 21 and 25. And that's, just to clarify that, that's from us measuring with our laser measuring device uh -huh. um, in the field. All right, because um, on the ground, it doesn't necessarily strike me that way, but, but you've measured it. Um, and, uh, when you move it forward, will you 
move the entire house or will you take it into pieces? We've had lots of house movings and, and it's a checkered past, frankly. Yeah, you know, the, the nice thing about this existing structure is it's a rectangle. Relatively uh, compact. And, and yeah, so it'll be, once the old additions are removed and that original rectangular okay. footprint is, it'll be, as far as house moving goes, relatively easy to move, and, and it all be moved together as one unit. It will be unit. moved together, yeah. but it may be down to the studs at that point, or uh, at that decided. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I'm not sure what the at what point they'll. Yeah, they they would probably do most of the demo work before they move it to lighten the load. The load. Yeah. All right. Thank you. I think those are my questions at this point. Okay, we have any uh, <clears throat> further discussion, questions? Okay, go ahead. Thank you, Vice Chair McKinnon. Yeah. Um, Carl, thanks for the presentation and all your good drawings. Uh, what's the, uh, I, I see apparent from the drawings, it looks like the uh, roof height, the ridge height, and then um, the exterior windows facing the street Bridge height's gonna be higher than existing, and then the uh, windows face on the second floor, you're gonna raise those up higher too, correct? Yeah. That's correct, uh, I was yeah. trying to get from the, your drawings of the existing, um, what's the uh, ceiling height of the rooms on the second floor closest to the street? Uh, uh, proposed or existing? Uh, no, the existing ceiling height. It's, uh, well, the existing plate height is... Yeah, six foot... Uh, six. Um, Six five. Six five. Yeah, and then and then there's uh, a bit of a roof roof slope, you know, uh, in there, and then the ceiling height is close to eight feet, somewhere in that neighborhood. Okay. Yeah. Um, but right. those the window head height there on that six those, five. Yeah. Yeah, is really low, and so the sill is really low, and part of our. Um, reason for wanting to raise that is and be able to raise those windows is a safety factor uh, that uh, they've got kids um, okay. and the, the sill is way down at like two feet above right, the floor. Right, yeah. You've, uh, you've seen other uh, uh, homes where uh, for child protection, you know, they'll, they'll be until the children get older, you know, you've, there are some interior things that could be addressed in child safety issue. Uh, so my impression of the drawing is that so um, uh, there's an existing street presence now with the uh, proposed plan. Um, so ridge is getting a little bit higher, and then um, the uh, windows. So initially getting closer and taller. It, those are two things I think that are maybe impacting the existing character of the of the of the, of the street. Um, uh, have you thought about any designs where? The, um, in addition to uh, moving it forward, not doing anything to perceive even, even a higher building. Because I think the window heights and the bridge heights might make even a, a more of a, a looming, not looming is, is too strong of a word, but it's changing the character a little bit. Have you thought about not raising those windows? Because you have eight foot ceilings. So, yeah. we, we, we have, um, when you see Mike stand up, you'll see how tall he is. <laughs> okay. And, and yeah, yeah. Mike's going to jump in. Yeah. Hi. Hi, Mike Meese. Yeah. Um, when you look at the massing in the house, I, I, I suggest you guys go look. You have a massive house, a massive house, and a little teeny house way in the back. Mm -hmm. When I go to see my house, mm -hmm. half the time I've done it, I've gone to the wrong house. Mm -hmm. That's how small and set back the house is. So mm -hmm. when you think about moving it five or seven feet and adding a couple inches to the height, it is still gonna be by far the smallest house. That it'll be very small looking. And I suggest you go, you go look at it if you're, you're interested. It, it'll surprise you on how that house gets lost as it currently is. Okay, great, thank you. Good, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I'll disclose, I have visited the uh, property probably about two or three times okay. to, to, to look at all these issues. Okay, okay. so, yeah. Okay, the, uh, those, um, those are my questions for now, thanks. Okay. 
Can I go back and sit? We have additional discussion or comments from board members? Um, sure, I'll make a comment. Um, I wanted to um, make a comment about the exterior siding. And I think a lot of times with these older homes, it's true that the siding material is so old and it has a lot of dry rot and termites. And also another issue with the exterior is with the new building codes in the shear wall um, requirements that we need to submit to the city in order to get permits for some of these projects require um, wrapping the exterior with structural plywood. So <clears throat> in order to do that, we almost always have to strip the exterior of the house. Um, there are some cases if a, if a project is minimum, a minimum addition or a small uh, project, we can do the shear wall on the, on the inside, which is nice, but sometimes um, with these projects, we're almost required to strip the exterior. But I think it is true if the, um, if the documentation is here with what's existing and the architect and contractor try to match it as best possible. I think that's, I think that's the best approach. And then the house is, uh, has a better structural quality in the end. Um, and then also I, <clears throat> I have visited the house when it was for sale. And I, I think it's, an, it's, ador it's adorable, but then you go in the back and you see this sort of 70s uh, atrium thing that just doesn't work with the existing house at all. So I'm, I, I think it's great that you're, you're doing something that has, uh, matches the integrity of the existing home and eliminating that atrium looking feature. So I, 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 think, it looks, I think it looks great. Yeah, Beth uh, has another comment. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the drawing is showing the uh, the new pr roof is gonna, not going to be as steep as the existing roofs. Yeah, the proposed pitch is four and a half to twelve, as opposed to the existing pitch, which is five to twelve. Yes, David. David. I would say, from my experience, that's imperceptible. It's not. No one can see that. I, I, Although it does lower the ridge by a half an inch per foot, so yeah, I, I would agree with you that yeah. it's a mi minor change. But the uh, plans are showing the total ridge height is increasing because they're raising plate heights over here. According to what I understand the drawings to be. The plate height is changing height in the front, and then the ridge height is changing. So is the mismatching roof pitch, um, what was the reasoning for that? Is that so that the, that the addition doesn't exceed the existing roof ridge height? Is that the lower roof The reduced roof pitch was uh, part of the combination of factors in, in uh, uh, being able to keep the, the total structure within the daylight plane and, and height restriction. And working with our the allowed projection into the uh, daylight plane. I mean, I think sometimes if it makes an architectural difference, the, the board allows that or the planning department allows those non-conform, well, to keep the, the architecture consistent, but I, don't, I, I didn't actually notice it until Beth's, Beth brought it up, so. Yeah, I, I, I think it would be imperceivable from anyone walking by looking at it. But, but if, you know, if, if uh, the board wanted us to keep it at 5 and 12 and allowed our height and uh, uh, daylight plane projection to encroach a little further, that'd be fine. Uh, Vice Chair McKinnon, uh, permission to provide a comment. Um, it, uh, it would not um, 
be normally allowed to exceed the daylight plane or the, or the maximum uh, building height. Um, so that's not something that the HRB can actually uh, approve through this, through this process. Just wanted to mention that. Okay, well, thank you for that clarification. And it has been reviewed for daylight plane issue. That is correct. Uh, Beth, you have a comment? <clears throat> Comments have been uh, covered. Uh, I, I'm the worrier on the board who always worries about houses that are getting moved. Um, and uh, by the way, just as a as a little historic sidelight, we didn't get any real history of the house. This house has uh, true credentials as a Professorville house. The the first owner was Professor Seward, and um, he was a, a, a revered part of the English department at Stanford University, and um, he also was a war hero. He volunteered to be in the ambulance corps as a private in the First World War, quickly was made a lieutenant, and was decorated by the French government with the Croix de Guerre and the uh, Legion of Honor medals and the Belgian government, and then came back and taught for many years at Stanford. And his wife had a beautiful voice and taught music. So this is your, your perfect Professor Bill Cuthbert. Uh, any further comments from the, the board members? Questions? Uh, Martin? Yes, thank you, Vice Chair McKinnon. Um, going back to this um, daylight plane intrusion of the, of the gable, um, uh, so it sounds like the, uh, the change in roof slope from 5 and 12 to 4.5 and 12, that's because of an ordinance of daylight plane, not for any historic design integrity reasons, correct? Um, and uh, so what's wagging the tail of the dog here? The ordinance or the historic character? Um, I guess this points out to the idea of if there was a study session before drawings, this is not a study session, this is for a motion for approval or, or denial or conditions. Um, the value of a study sessions have been, and um, you know, we've talked about this before, is that uh, what's, what's the most important aspect of a true historic Professorville house? Ordinance for daylight plane or historic preservation if there's an HIE or home improvement exception that can allow for keeping a historic structure intact as much as possible. Uh, it's just one of my concerns about uh, you know, when we don't have study sessions to flesh these things out. We can still make decisions today about uh, what, what to do with this. Um, anyway, it's just a concern of, uh, we're talking about historic integrity for the character of the neighborhood. Um, let's pay attention to historic qualities and then there are exceptions that, that can, owners can apply for. Um, just a comment on process. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the staff would like to make a comment, Matthew. Yes, thank you. Um, I would ju just like to clarify staff's um, recommended condition regarding um, the proposal to move the building forward on the lot. Um, the applicant did include um, scaled drawings to indicate um, the distance that the building's proposed to be moved, but didn't actually indicate the, the distances. So, um, so the, the figures that are in the report are based on uh, my measurements using the scaled drawings. Um, to, just to clarify what staff's condition, uh, recommended condition is that the building, if it's moved, not be moved forward um, further than five feet behind the required uh, minimum front setback, which is 20 feet. So in other words, maintain a minimum 25 foot front setback is, is staff's recommended uh, condition. Thank you. And I'd like to add something on that. Um, 
not about the setback, but about the project's eligibility for a home improvement exception, which it's not, unfortunately. Sorry. So um, if it would help in the future for reports, we can just clarify whether a project is or is not eligible um, based on the amount of um, exterior wall retained uh, okay. in place. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, David. Uh, I have a question for Matt about setbacks. What's the contextual setback? On that side of the street. In other words, what are the what are the, what's the setback for the other houses at least um, on either side? Most of the houses appear to be um, at or close to the front setback. Twenty five feet of twenty feet. Okay. Okay, uh, Martin. Yeah, I have another question for the applicant or owner. The uh, there's a condition talking about the uh, front porch. Uh, material uh, being uh, uh, brick versus concrete on your plans. Um, uh, any thoughts of if that became a condition to have, right now the existing is brick out there on the front porch there. Um, yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, um, Beth. Uh, oh, that reminded me, and show that um, uh, you're going to plan to remove that front porch uh, shed roof and make it extend it all across the front of the house. Um, was there a particular reason for that uh, change? You want to come up and talk a little bit about that? Sorry, I forgot that. Uh, yeah, the, the reason for that was to clean up that front elevation where the front porch is. Right now there's that shed roof and the bay window roof that seem to visually conflict with each other. Um, and our proposal was to replicate that shed roof, extend it the width of the house so it captures the bay window and uh, creates a simpler front entry element. See that as, as historic fabric and changing of what's there. But thank you. Uh, yeah, and Carl, the, uh, uh, if we follow the uh, staff's recommendation of moving the building five feet forward, Roughly five feet. Uh, would that maple tree be able to stay so, in the front? Uh, I don't think so. Okay. Yeah. It's actually dangerously leaning over. It's not going to survive. I see. Anyway. Okay. So Thank you. It's already it was probably planted way too early, and it's 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 just going to fall over in you know five ten years whatever. <laughs> okay. Thank you for that information. Additional uh, comments, questions from the board? I was just going to make one comment. Um, in terms of this front um, entry porch, did you consider maybe just having the porch go, uh, not having the porch here, but having it include the bay window in the front door instead of extending it the whole way, just to kind of keep that, that historic look on that one corner? I don't know. Uh, yeah, we did consider that. We, we considered a, a variety of different solutions there, and we, we felt that what we are proposing was the best. Um, we're not fixated on it. I, I mean, if that were something to discuss further, but uh, uh, we, we did explore several different options uh, and, and felt that that was the best solution. Okay. Uh, Martin? Yeah, Carl, would you uh, be agreeable to, uh, if the, uh, as a staff member, as Mr. Weintraub just mentioned, uh, if uh, 
instead of a 20 foot setback from the front, if it was 25 foot setback, would that be? Yes. Okay, okay great, thank you for that. Okay. Also, the, uh, I'll be making some other comments as we proceed on the, um, on the rear proposed rear elevation, I see the, the rendering showing a, a single light uh, glass doors on the first on the first floor in the rear. Um, I'd be suggesting if this becomes a, we move to a motion uh, that there'll be uh, uh, at least some horizontal mutton bars on the back there, just so it's not so contrasty with uh, the other windows in the house that have some mutton bars. Or so. that just a comment on aesthetics. Thank you. Yeah. See, I have uh, one question or comment uh, regarding the proposed light well. Uh, st the staff recommendation was to uh, relocate it to the rear of the addition, which would be a less intrusive introduction into the uh, remodel. Uh, how, what, what is your feeling on that? Our, our experience with that is that it it uh, then creates a major barrier between the rear yard and the rear living spaces of the house. You know, that uh, uh, the indoor-outdoor connection, um, it, it functionally is not desirable. Uh, do you, you think that uh, it compromises the historic integrity of the house by having a light well in the front of the house? Well, it's not in the front, it's on the side, and as I mentioned, it's, it's, on the side. it's not visible. Okay. Uh, there'll be a fence in front of it, the, the fence between the side of the house and the side property line that would okay. be in front of the light well. All right, thank you, thank you for the clarification. Martin. Yeah, thank you, Vice Chair McKinnon. On, on that note, uh, we approved a, a project on Addison Avenue uh, maybe I think it was a 300 block or something like that where they had the same feature it had a light well on the side and from the streets point of view there, there's a there's actually a low fence you're proposing even a higher fence there but even with the low fence and it was an open rail fence it's uh, uh, I don't see that that light well was I mean it was actually in, kind of invisible from the street point of view because it was just a six Not inch curb. Right. yeah so I didn't, I didn't see that one as an issue and nor would I see it on this one too okay. thank you uh, David Bauer. Uh, I'm assuming that when you put a rail up around the light well, it wouldn't even attach to the building because that's not required. Is that correct? So we it would preserve the side, the historic fabric on yeah, the side of the building. Yeah, right. There'll be like a, you know at the at the yeah. front facing the street, there'll be the fence. So down the long side of the uh, light well, parallel to the wall of the house, there'll be a rail. And then at the far end, the back end, there's it's open because the stair comes up there. I mean, well, the only thing I, I I'm bothered by on the front facade, uh, Margaret's brought up the overhang on the uh, in the porch, which I think actually significantly changes the character of the building from its current state. Um, is the fact that you have a six foot fence on the right hand side of the property, which kind of is a big visual barrier. Um, if that were a four-foot fence, it would be a little more, um, a little gentler transition to the backyard. But I mean, wouldn't uh, I wouldn't have problems supporting this. Um, but I, I guess I'm troubled also on by the fact that you have three po um, posts on the front porch. <laughs> and I've looked and looked at this. Um, I know you've got them centered so that they're equal, equidistant. But I, it, to me, it it makes that look more like a back porch than a front porch. I mean, it, there's nothing, there's no drama to get into the house. So I'm wondering, I'm just wondering aloud about that. And I apologize for being late to the meeting, but, um, and you may have covered this. Next question is, why is the front door being replaced? Uh, we were gonna replace it with a solid, uh, more uh, energy efficient and, and more of a craftsman style door. It's a, it's a, I, I'm quite certain it's not the original door. And actually Mike has some info so on that. So my, uh, my tenant who's running out right now, the, the lock was broke so I hired a locksmith to fix it. Um, he told me the lock is probably, you know, a 1940s vintage lock. Um, no parts available, couldn't fix it. 
So what I, and the, the door is very thin. So we, we have a, a significant problem if we want to keep that door replacing the hardware um, so that it's functional and keeping the door. We, we don't mind, obviously, if you like the style of door, keeping a Dutch door, you know, it's just the fact that it's a door that's going to be very difficult to maintain in the future because it's old and it's clearly not original, at least from the locksmith's uh, point of view. Of course, 1940s is still, it's still old. More, than 50, right. more than 50 years old. Well, and if still you could find me the locks, maybe I can. <laughs> uh, you know, there, there, are lots of, there, there are actually lots of ways of getting the locks to work. Well, you know, so, so this is, he couldn't find the parts at all. No, no, you, I mean, you have to replace it. Part, so. it's a, I'm assuming it's a mortise lock. Very thin. That's the problem. Yeah. Okay. Well, I just wanted to understand well, where, yeah, where that was going. <laughs> okay. Thank you, McKenna. Okay. Do we uh, are we prepared to uh, proceed with uh, are we prepared to proceed with a motion here? Vice Chair McKinnon, if I, if I may provide just one, one additional comment um, in relation to the discussion that just occurred on the front door. Um, if the board um, is considering approving a replacement front door, I would just ask them to um, note that the proposed front door includes a sash that is modeled after the decorative um, uh, iron, uh, excuse me, decorative leaded windows that are existing, and that might be seen as conjectural. So um, if, uh, if the board is considering recommending a or approving a replacement door, um, they might consider approving it uh, without that um, sash detail. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yes, Beth. Uh, in terms of, of beginning to craft a motion, should we have some discussion in terms of what we might like to uh, change or add to the, the really very thorough list of, of conditions before we start to um, actually Well, yeah, why, why don't we go, go over one by one on those conditions? Okay, that, was, yeah, that, that would, would be make good. sense. Okay, Martin. I also, another question, um, uh, is it, does the board agree that uh, in language of the motion, how, uh, how this proposed project meets the Secretary of Interior standards, particularly with differentiation and compatibility of, of new items? I, that would make s Okay. Well, yeah, there's a, there was an analysis uh, right. in the staff report. Yeah, yeah. But I think our motion should include that if, if it's voting in favor that uh, it meets the standards. Right. Thank you. Okay. Well, probably the best way is to uh, approach this is to go through each of the staff recommendations and formulate uh, a response to that or a board opinion. It's on page seven. The first one being maintain a minimum 30 foot front setback, which is five additional feet in order to maintain the existing pattern of varied setbacks on the block. Uh, Vice Chair McKinnon, if I, if I just may remind the board that um, staff has clarified that that would be a 25 foot 25 setback. foot, yeah. okay. Thank you very much. So 30 foot is now 25 foot. If we have all right uh, in terms of, of I'll, I'll just read that into the record right here okay. so we locate the proposed basement light well in the new rear addition behind the back wall of the historic structure in order to make, minimize the visual impact at the front of the property and protect the historic integrity okay, okay that's so, basically what yes yeah, so we is. have uh, discuss that with the applicant and um, is it the board's thought to uh, allow the uh, 
side uh, light well uh, with some screening and as far back as possible. I actually think the location of the light well on the side is the best location for it because if it's in the back, it, it, it becomes a dangerous situation with your outdoor living space and having kids in the backyard and then you've got this, this big sunken light well. I think putting it over to the side is, is a, I think, preserves the backyard and the use of the backyard a little bit better and is a better safety issue. And with the fence along the front, I think you, it won't be visible from the front. So I think in okay. terms of the functionality of the house, I think the side is so fine. I, I, I seem to hear from the board that they're, we're okay with the, the proposed uh, light well being on the side of the structure. Okay, let's go on to three. Retain the existing front door, which appears to be an, an intact historic feature. So, so, excuse me for interrupting. We're gonna delete item number two. Which yes, was I guess we're going by to get our board feelings in each of these items and then okay. formulate uh, so a motion. If, right, so if we are all comfortable with where the light well is shown on the drawings, then yes. number two is okay. effectively so removed. We're gonna, so okay, we can say we can delete the staff recommendation then on two. Right, we're just not, yeah. Okay. okay just wanna be clear. Okay. Uh, item number three, retain the existing front door, which appears to be an intact historic feature. Yeah, yeah um, I'll support uh, Mr. Weintraub's uh, comment about uh, not adding the, uh, the diamond grill shapes, because I see that on the historic windows, mm -hmm. but I would support not putting that on a, on a new, on, a, on any new door. Mm -hmm. hearing all that you were saying. Uh, my comment was, uh, if, we, uh, if there's gonna be a, a new door, uh, my comment would be not to include the diamond patterns that you see on the historic windows up above. So. Oh, because that would be false historicism. Correct, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, then, as an addition to that, I would like to put in a condition to protect and retain uh, all the leaded glass windows. Would that be appropriate? Yeah. And they're only on the front. Uh, oh no, they run around the sides. This is an unusual house. It really is a very unique feature that they spent the money for uh, those leaded glass windows down the side. Um, okay, so. Yeah. so Item three, we would uh, not introduce, uh, we call it the, the, the grill work, is that? The diamond pattern. The di diamond, diamond pattern, pattern and protect and maintain all leaded glass w windows. Yeah. And the front door would be uh, Beth. I, I would still like to keep the front door, but uh, I don't know how the rest of the board feels. Yeah, let's ask staff a question. You know, I have never seen a Dutch door on a building that was pre-World War II. It is any, or even the board members, have anybody seen that? That's a, that's a very sort of 50s, 60s motif. Um, yeah, I would agree that um, I don't. I wouldn't know the exact date, but um, you know, the um, apparently the locksmith that looked at it uh, estimated that it was approximately 1940s. That could easily be 1950s. That sounds about right to me. That and that looks about right to me in terms of um, the age of this door. Right. Well, that still would be you know older than 50 years and technically um, protected fabric. It's it's an unusual place to put a Dutch door and. So I, I'm less enamored with saving it if it has other compromises. You're recommending uh, keeping the front door? No, I'm actually feeling that that um, if the door is compromised, yeah. and apparently um, at least the lock issue makes mm -hmm. that problem makes retaining it problematic. I, I'm uh, somewhat ambivalent about requiring that it be saved. 
Yeah. I'm pers personally okay with changing the door if that's what the applicant uh, feels. Should that be reviewed for. by staff or who should help with the selection on that front door? Implicit in, in uh, the number five is that staff would review styles with anything that's replaced. So I think we're covered by having um, a, a new door be complementary, consistent, but not um, confusing it with existing fabric. Okay, so we're saying okay, new door, okay in the new door. I'm, I'm um, willing to support that. Okay. Martin. All right. Uh, so number three becomes uh, okay to replace the door with a new door. With no, uh, grill. with no grills. Okay. Uh, item four. We've already heard from the applicant that uh, he would be in support of uh, uh, changing it from concrete to uh, brick. Okay, brick. Brick. Uh, okay. 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 I think we've covered all those items. We're going to add in under number three that all the existing diamond patterned glass be protected and yes. uh, not changed. Okay. Just, just for the record. Would one of the uh, board members care to take a stab at uh, a motion then? Who's brave enough? <laughs> Uh, Vice Chair McKinnon, if I may, um, maybe to just get the board started, um, I'll go ahead and read out what I believe the conditions uh, were that were discussed. Okay. Um, number one, maintain a minimum 25-foot front setback um, with the existing with the with the uh, primary structure. Um, number two is has been struck. Um, number three, allow replacement of the existing front door as proposed with the exception of uh, do not include the decorative diamond sash as, as currently proposed um, and retain all the existing uh, decorative leaded glass windows. Um, number four, um, as, as stated, um, surface the proposed new porch and steps with brick. And um, number five, as stated, submit samples um, to the historic planner for review and approval. Well done. Do you want to add any comment about meeting the Secretary of Interior standards? Oh, definitely. So um, that would, uh, that the Secretary of the Interior standards would actually be a finding that the board would make during the motion. It wouldn't necessarily have to be a condition of approval. Yeah. No, but it's part of the motion is what I mean. Yeah, yeah the motion should state that it, the uh, project meets the Secretary of the Interior standards. Rehabilitation. All right, I, I'll take a stab then. Okay. All right, that um, the uh, project for uh, 262 Kingsley Avenue, um, as uh, presented by the applicant, uh, and with the uh, conditions that have just been read into the record um, and to state that uh, based on the, the uh, Secretary of Standards uh, for Rehabilitation uh, that it appears to be uh, basically consistent with the Secretary of Interior Standards as stated. All right. Do we have a second for the motion? I'll second. Second. Okay. We have a motion on the floor. All in favor? Aye. 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 The, the motion passes unanimously with one, two, three, four, five voting. Uh, Chair Kohler absent. Uh, board member DeSicchio absent. And who else? Anybody else? I guess that's it. Thank you. Appreciate your interest in historic preservation. Thank you for, for working on a very significant project in Professorville. Welcome back, Chair Fuller.
Let's just move forward, I guess. Item number two. Okay, we'll move on to item number two. I'm back. Okay, 203 Forest Avenue, request by Ken Hayes Architects, Inc., on behalf of 203 Avenue, LLC, for architectural review of a proposed a proposal to construct a new 5,000 square foot I rounded it up from 4999 to 5,000. Uh, square foot residential addition to an, exist, an existing 4,626 square foot commercial building on a 5,000 square foot site in downtown commercial uh, zoning district uh, CD-C apostrophe P. Um, the, Oh, I'm sorry. So, does staff report for this? Yes. Thank you. Oh, you introduce you. Okay. Thank you for the introduction and good morning, board members. The proposed residential units and supporting facility will be added to an existing commercial building that was constructed in 1958 for a dry cleaning service. The current use of the building is an office. The property has no existing historic destinations and has not been evaluated previously. As the building is older than 50 years, the applicant submit a historic resource evaluation to assess the property's eligibility under the National Register of Historic Place, the California Register of Historic Resource, and Local Historic Inventory. The HRE was reviewed by staff Based on the evaluation, the existing property is not found historically significant. Although the property is not located within a designated historic district, the Urban Design Guide in downtown identified Amundsen Street as a secondary district with its own distinct architectural characteristic and strong historic character at large. This block of Amundsen Street includes historic property of category two, three, and four. The project received the first formal ARB hearing on May 21st. The ARB vote to continue the project review to a date uncertain. Since the Downtown Urban Design Guide described Amundsen Street has distinct architectural and historic character, the ARB member concurred with staff recommendations to seek for HRB feedback on the application, particularly for architectural review finding number four. This finding is about compatibility of the project design with the area having unifying design character or historic character. Staff also request the HRB to provide feedback on the historic resource evaluations and its recommend finding. The HRB comments will be forwarded to the ARB prior to the next public hearing. The and um, the historic preservation planner is here um, to answer any question you may have. Um, prior to the HRB um, hearing, um, some of the members request for a perspective uh, from Amundsen Street, which is passed along uh, and provided at places. That concludes that report. Okay, um, Matt. Uh, thank you, Chair Kohler. Um, so in regards to the HRB's review and the, the items that staff is uh, asking the HRB to review, um, I would um, ask the board to consider what is, um, what is identified in the urban, uh, downtown urban design guide line, uh, excuse me, urban design guide um, as the specific characteristics that make Emerson Street a secondary district of some importance. And again, we're not talking about a historic district. It's, there's not an identified historic district. We're talking about an area that has essentially some special uh, architectural and historic character that yet does not rise to the level of a historic district. Um, so what's um, identified in the urban design guide as the specific characteristics that make this a, an important secondary district are um, 
Features such as the large open storefronts, often with high ceilings and transom windows protected by front awnings. Um, buildings are also individualistic while conforming to some or most of these historic patterns, and recent development has, has supported this historic architectural expression. Um, so again, what's called out specifically as important to the character are large open storefronts, often with high ceilings and transom windows. Um, so um, in, in the HRB's consideration, staff would recommend that the HRB focus in on those specific areas. Thank you. I have a quick question. I'm just reading the, uh, this list on attachment B. Um, can you tell me how this uh, fits in with the review? Um, it's in the middle here. It says, Palo Alto Municipal Code 18.76.020D, Architectural Review Findings. Um, and this is, in, because of these findings, is in part why it's before us today. Is that part of it? I'm just trying. So um, finding four specifically is the finding that the um, HRB's advice to the ARB um, would have some um, some consideration. I'll read item, that. Excuse me, item four on this list here. Yes, okay. yes, exactly. Finding number four, in areas considered by the board as having a unified design character or historical character, the design is compatible with such character. So. Um, okay. So that that's in part why we're here today. Okay. Any other staff comments or anything? Or we just. Yes, thank you for finding those generic findings. Um, so at the next ARB hearing, and you'll hear from the applicant on um, some revisions that they're contemplating to the project based on the ARB's comments. Um, at the next ARB meeting, we would have uh, findings that would um, incorporate any statements that the HRB would wish to make, some specific findings for this project. Okay, so you're looking for us to give um, feedback so that we could feedback, incorporate. general comments. We're not voting or anything today. It's just a study session in a way. Well, this is this is to provide um, comments on the project as you've received it, but also we do have uh, the applicant uh, who wishes to discuss some other sure. concepts. I'm just trying to understand yeah. what this is. It's a little different than I think we've experienced in the past. Not for quite a while, I don't think, anyway. Okay. Matthew. So will we be voting on at least a kind of consensus of the board? So there's there's no action required by the board. Uh, the board can approach it a number of different ways. They can provide individual board member comments that can be transferred to the ARB, or the board can um, take it upon themselves to develop um, a, a unified um, comments that um, that could be voted on by the board. Again, the, it wouldn't be an action on the application. It would simply be a vote that, yes, these are the unified comments that the board is transmitting to the ARB. Yes, yeah, so if we come to a general consensus that this is, these are the items we think are important, that would be an expression of our, okay. Exactly. Okay, so uh, I don't have my schedule of events here, but I think this uh, presentation by the applicant, appropriate? Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chair Kohler, members of the board. My name is Ken Hayes with Hayes Group Architects. Um, I'll be presenting the project uh, on behalf of uh, my client, Dave Kleiman. Uh, before I start, I'd like to thank uh, planners uh, Fong and Weintraub and, and Amy French for helping us bring this before you. Um, I really want to talk about how we, how we arrived at the solution that we have today. Um, if we have time, I can certainly talk about other ideas that we have contemplated since. Um, but that's not part of this presentation. This is what I showed the ARB. Uh, the site is on the corner, uh, it's a 5,000 square foot site on the corner of Emerson and Ramona, located right here. Um, in this area, um, there are, I'm sorry, what? And Forest, not Ramona, I read Ramona. Emerson and Forest, the cross streets. Um, in this neighborhood, we have the Epiphany Hotel, that's seven or eight stories. We have 201 Hamilton, that's about, I think, three stories we have. Um, some historic structures here. We have Bucca de Beppo, we have uh, um, Delfina, uh, and then our site uh, located here across the street is a multi-story mixed use project. Um, and then a recently remodeled building here and then the uh, Gordon Biersch buildings in here. Uh, on across uh, Forest, we have a parking lot, the one-story building, 
and then a, uh, a one-story building on the opposite corner here. Uh, there's an existing, um, it was a former cleaners, uh, if you've read the staff report, uh, and it's currently occupied by uh, an office tenant. Uh, it happens to be at this, uh, at the transition between the SOFA uh, to RT35 district and the more dense um, downtown CDC P district. And so that, that division line runs right down uh, Forest. <clears throat> Excuse me. There's a view of Emerson looking north, project site located here, the mixed use project here, parking lot on the right. This is a view looking west um, on, uh, on Forest. Our site is over here. Again, the mixed use project there, the one story building over here on the opposite corner. And then a view looking east on Forest towards City Hall, um, project site located here and then the parking lot you can see better on this side there. So everything to the right is in the SOFA 2 area. The existing building, uh, the mid-century um, modernist building, um, not a whole lot of detail, uh, has no windows that face the street either on the Emerson frontage here or on the uh, forest frontage on the other side. This was a carport that you would drive through um, and there's an existing parking space that we need to maintain that uh, is in that area, <clears throat> according to city records. Uh, the building next door, again, is Delfina, uh, which is about the same height as the concrete block wall that faces Emerson. Uh, there's a big cork oak um, in front of the building that uh, is going to stay, and we're going to try to enhance its health by some creative landscaping techniques that uh, uh, Dave Doctor, the, the arborist, has recommended. Uh, building next door on Forest uh, is, again, a mid-century concrete block and glass uh, uh, modern building, and then our project site located here. You can see there's no uh, windows that face the street at this time um, on that edge. An existing oak tree that's very nice uh, is on this side as well. You can see where the cars park now. There's a driveway cut on both frontages. Do I have the same 10 minutes I do with the ARB, or I don't see, is the timer going? Just keep going. Okay, because I can tell I'm taking longer. Uh, if, the it gets, if it gets too long, I'll let you know. It won't be that long. Um, the program is to provide a, a new single-family dwelling above the existing building while the existing ground floor tenant remains in the building. So a very tough challenge. So we have to span across this building. We need to provide two parking spaces for the residential unit. We want to create outdoor living spaces for the residential unit, enhance the landscaping for both pedestrians and the residential users on both street frontages. Um, because we have this big front porch turnaround area um, and we have to maintain a parking space, um, we want to create a front porch, if you will, um, that uh, encompasses that as well as the main entry to the ground floor space. Uh, on the roof, uh, we'll provide new uh, photovoltaic panels to power uh, Mr. Kleiman's house and, of course, use sustainable materials, daylighting opportunities, and then lastly, relate to the contextual materials and building features. These, of course, aren't in any particular order. This is a site plan forest here at the bottom. Uh, this is the solar orientation, so south is down into the left. So this is pretty harsh exposure, so it'd be kind of nice if this space was all covered, uh, and that may explain why there's a covering there now. Um, but uh, we're continuing er, to keep that covered. We'll be enhancing all the sidewalk curbs and gutters around the perimeter of the site. This is the existing cork, uh, cork oak, new tree, new tree, existing oak here. And then out in the public realm, we are uh, working with Dave Doctor to provide these large landscape transition spaces between the size, sidewalk and the street. Um, we close off the driveway cut here. We keep the driveway cut here. Um, we pick up some parking on the street with the elimination of this driveway, uh, driveway cut, and then we're gonna maintain the same kind of treatment for these trees down, uh, down forest to give some vegetation out on the street. This is the front porch area that will have the handicapped park. That space needs to be handicapped accessible, so the handicapped accessible space will be located here. You can walk in from the street here. You can walk in from the street here where we have an opening and a canopy that comes off across the sidewalk to announce the, the entry. Then the residential, or I'm sorry, the parking here and the residential parking is located on the side of the building. Uh, it's a covered area uh, garage for two tandem spaces. And then the residential unit has its main entrance here. 
um, in an elevator, and then a secondary uh, exit stair or entrance stair that comes up uh, the building here. This wall here is the existing wall of the building um, today that has, uh, has no windows. That's a concrete block wall that we're using for a bearing wall. So all of this is existing perimeter. We can't add floor area without adding parking, and there's nowhere to put parking. Uh, commercial floor area, that is. Uh, the second floor uh, is above and has large outdoor terrace uh, at the rear, um, away from, to make it more private was uh, our rationale. Um, the, uh, the building is like a, a block that sits over the top of the existing building, and I'll show you how um, we arrived at that. But essentially, it lives to this back side here, and bedrooms across the front. Master bedroom, however, is towards the back of the building, and the utilities are down this side of the building here. So historic character of, uh, of Emerson. Uh, this is Vive. Um, we actually did the interior um, of Vive. Uh, when they moved in. Historic building characterized, uh, I believe, by a large opening that is infilled with transom windows that are fairly delicate and have a vertical um, sort of rhythm to them of a, of a square that is subdivided to create this pattern. Uh, and it has a, a large uh, canopy that runs the length of the building um, and then the main structure. Fairly simple. Uh, building across the street. A um, little more detailed, still has these square transom windows. Because it's painted green, you don't see the pattern as, as, as vividly as you do here. Again, subdivided with another vertical to create these rectangular windows. I've used that in our window patterns. Um, the facade of the building has this deliberate, lit, uh, deliberate uh, terracotta tile outline um, that uh, creates a contrast to the building uh, mass itself um, and actually creates these panels. Um, here, and then if you think of it, this is a panel as well. However, it's subdivided into transom windows above and uh, the entry window below. The Acme Glass Building, um, beautiful uh, glazed uh, tile, um, but it's a simple rectangular block. Um, and that simple rectangular block actually is all poured in place concrete on the two side walls and the back wall. It's board form concrete, so it has a nice scale to it. Um, v, and you see that concrete here. If you back up, you see it more. Um, the Buca de Beppo building, again, a simple block that has uh, horizontal uh, board formed concrete as well. Um, and so we're, we're keying on that, um, that material and construction technique um, as well. At the end of the block, the new uh, remodeled Epiphany um, Hotel, um, eight stories, and it has this um, interesting metal cladding um, that is uh, like a big framework that uh, the building is sort of uh, circumscribed by. Um, and uh, we're picking up on that material. You should have a material board in front of you, although it's not this busy, it's more monolithic. Um, and then lastly, the epiphany on the ground floor has these perforated metal panels. And so we've created these transom windows, and I'll show you in a minute, that are filled in with the perforated metal so that at night you get a similar kind of uh, of look, maybe not this intense, um, but then during the day you get a dappled light on that southern exposure that comes into that front porch area. <clears throat> this is the forest facade. The mid-century building next door, we're essentially pulling across the horizontal line of that canopy and it wraps around and runs down uh, Emerson. Um, we have board form concrete here in front that acts as a support for the larger block above that we're trying to say that larger block is a simple block similar to Acme Glass um, in, in, in the, the concept of just a simple block. We've then subdivided this. This is all residential up in this area um, into these transom panels. Um, and then the one panel here becomes a large panel because that's where my stair is. And so as you go up and down the stair, I want people to see, be seen and see um, out. So that's more expressive, I think, of, of that sort of feel. Um, the, uh, the wall below uh, is perforated by some vertical windows so that there's some connection to the street. This is the main entrance for the residence where you would, um, you would come in. The window pattern, again, we've got this framework that defines the main body of the building, similar to what I just showed you on Emerson, in my opinion. Um, and then the pattern of windows, well, instead of it being a horizontal pattern of verticals, we've created a, um, uh, a pattern that runs vertically, but not unlike the horizontal delicacy of the, the buildings on, um, on Emerson. 
um, and then have a, a, a transom above here as well. So we have the transom here. Um, we could certainly do more down here um, to lighten that perhaps, but the idea this is filled in with that perforated metal. So the sunlight hitting that will create very beautiful shadows um, on the inside of this front porch area. If we go around to Emerson, again, you can see uh, the pattern of the windows uh, above. The transoms are a little more expressive on Emerson because that is the, the area that has that vocabulary. You don't really find it down, um, down forest. Um, this is the existing concrete block wall of the building that just so happens to be our main shear wall. Um, but we're keeping that definition because it relates to Delfina next door. Um, this, again, you see the simple block. If I had the Acme Glass building up here, you'd see that simple block, again, being defined. Um, and then uh, on the ground floor, uh, there's a seat wall where people can hang out on the corner and then a wall that's about five and a half feet high. This is all the board formed concrete starting here and running down forest. Our thinking was that people could hang out there um, and the front porch is protected and this wall, this screen wall screens the car that might be parked there. So in our opinion was that this enhanced sort of that pedestrian experience. This became the entry, this is the entry into the commercial space. There's a canopy that you don't see here. It's on there, but it's a glass canopy, so it's very fine. It's not unlike the canopy down here by the residents. Um, ARB commented that they thought that this wall should be low um, so that you do, in fact, see into the front porch uh, more uh, readily. Um, and then some 3D images of, uh, oh, lost my cursor, uh, of what that might look like. And again, from, uh, forest from across the street. So this really gives you an idea of how those transoms are uh, here. And these are some views inside. So the reality is it is very similar to Gordon Beers, for instance. You walk underneath through the entry opening and it pops up to like 18 feet um, on the inside. So it maintains that character that has been established by some of the other buildings on the street. And you can see the perforated metal up here that'll have the sunlight coming through. And then the, the handicapped parking space is here. We're trying to populate this with uh, pedestrian amenities, benches, planters, and so on. Another view. And then without the trees, and then with, with trees, although the cork oak is obviously a much larger tree, but we wanted to show the building. So thank you very much. I'm interested in your comments, and it would be very helpful if there was a consensus um, in terms of comments, and I don't know, if maybe a, 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 I don't know if you can do a motion or not, but have some definitive um, feedback. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, any board member? So this is just a kind of a discussion, correct, uh, Matt? Just basic discussion. I have no That's, cards from anyone speaking as well, by the way. Yeah, we, we haven't oh, received, received any speaker cards. Thank you. Okay. So we're leaving it open for discussion and questions if they come up. Is that? Yeah. Well, right? now that we have a speaker, I think normally. Ah. We, okay. Yeah. So, so we have a card from uh, Doria Suma. Would you like to come forward? And uh, good morning, um, Chair and Board Members. Really briefly, I wanted to thank staff for this um, because I think it was a really thorough uh, staff report and brought up a lot of concerns, most of them for the ARB. And I also wanted to thank the applicant for wanting to renovate a building instead of demolishing the building. If it was going to change at all, if you were going to make a re recommendations, I. I feel a little bit bad that the original building isn't really represented here as much as it could be, and though it's not considered an important historic building, it certainly has a historic um, feel for those who, I used to live right there, a block away, and walking by, and that openness on the corner, I think particularly, is a bit lost here. So I, I just wanted to um, give a shout out to the historic nature of the original building. I think it's kind of unique for downtown Palo Alto, and to say if there were changes that could be made, I think it would be nice if they could show the original building more. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else like to speak? OK, 
Okay, we'll bring it back to the board for some discussions. Mike, you seem to be want to say something. Thank you, Chair Kohler. I think the question that's uh, being asked here is a somewhat similar in the federal historic preservation to the concept of area potential effect. And that is when you have a project that is near or close to other historic properties, does that project have an impact on the historic character of the re re original historic properties? So does the proposed project support the unique historical character of Emerson Street between Hamilton and Forest, or does it degrade the character? I think that's the question that is being asked of us. Am I correct? That is correct. Okay. Um, I might add also that um, the uh, HRB may also comment on the findings from the HR, from the historic resource evaluation that was completed as well, which finds that the subject property is, is not a resource. So that might be the uh, approach we want to take. Does, does the project degrade or does it enhance or does it have no effect upon the historic fabric of Emerson Street? I, I just had a quick question about um, the reasoning behind the project and having a residential, almost a 4,000 square foot single residential unit on the top um, in a highly commercial zoned area. Is what's the background or the benefit or the reasoning to put a residence on top of the existing structure? Uh, it's a, a client's. Uh, um, desire to one of he lives downtown now, um, but uh, would love to be more engaged. He's well, he's sort of downtown north. Um, would love to be more engaged. Um, he's also doing uh, another project in town where we have a, a mixed uh, residential commercial use uh, building. Um, we probably have four others that are either recently completed um, or are in the design stage um, and at planning. And I think that it's a, um, it's a very progressive old idea of trying to um, bring residential uses downtown and it makes a lot of sense uh, to get uh, um, life back downtown. In this particular instance, he wants a big home. Um, there's no place to put additional parking. So even if we were to have more units, uh, unfortunately in the, in the downtown, uh, you can't buy parking for residential uses like you can for commercial uses. So if you were to add another unit, if that's where you were going, why is the unit so big? I don't want to put words in your mouth. Um, uh, there's no way to get the parking. So the two parking spaces we have are what's required for this use. Um, and then just to continue my comment, I, um, I just think that, that pushing the building all the way to the corner is really imposing for me. I think it, uh, it blocks a lot of sight. Um, cross sections. if it was in the middle of the block, I could see pushing it, but when it's on a corner, there's just a unique opportunity to, to allow sight lines. Um, I think this is really imposing. Um, I don't, I don't know the grills. They, to me, that just looks like a HVAC uh, air intake grill or something. I'm not, I'm not, I haven't really studied it closely enough. Um, and I, I have a hard time being convinced that that's a front porch, <laughs> but those are just my initial thoughts. I, th I just think it's a really imposing corner. That whole corner element um, is very commercial and it's, Palo Alto is still a residential town. Yes, you are putting a residence on that second floor, but this is just feels like um, it's just too big city pushing it to that corner. I just, that's what I'm reacting to. Other than the building directly across the street, which is probably 60 feet tall, um, every other building on that street is on the setback, and that's what the downtown guidelines encourage um, in, in to define that street sidewalk edge. Um, but the ARB had the same concern. Let's see, to, to continue along uh, in terms of some of the um, comments from the public, um, I too have some uh, real desire, you know, fondness for the current building that is there. Um, and I should divulge that I actually have spent quite a bit of time down there watching to see how this is used 
both on the weekends and during the week. So I've been sitting across the street looking at my plans and the sort of basic feeling on, on a weekend is that you get groups of people moving together to go to the eating establishment, Whole Foods, families are even riding bicycles through there. And uh, so it is very important that, that each corner have sufficient space for these groups of people. Uh, on the weekdays, it's very different. Um, and, and this photograph uh, of about five cars under that canopy is actually true. And it was very difficult for a, a <clears throat> delivery person to be able to get his delivery in to one of the businesses through that front door and uh, uh, safety of backing out across the street and back into, um, uh, let's see, that would be uh, forest that he was backing into. So um, it, it's a complicated, complicated corner, but one of my wonderings was whether the, the horizontal line of that existing building and whether that um, little screen, which is the support, on, could on be uh, kept and then utilizing some of the, the language that's in that screen to uh, the pattern in this screen is very small, and I'm wondering whether it could be a more artistic, right. like the the big screen I, that I, you I, saw, and big circles. That right. Would. Absolutely. Um, uh, I mean, it's our desire to not. We don't want that to look like a mechanical screen. We want it to look like artwork. Yes. Um, and I think it would be very fascinating to see the the light come through to the you know to the the, I'm calling it the front porch. Yeah, because that's area. exactly one of my concerns, that it, it's going to look like a dark hole. Right. It's going to look forbidding. And on the weekend, kids move through there and, and uh, see it as a very interesting passageway. And, and I think a number of the features have tended to block that view, block that openness. Uh, that's there, and um, it it's a lot going on, and and it feels, frankly, really strange to me to have the trash containers right there. Th there's there's too much going on in too little space, uh, you know, just functionally. It it's a real concern to me. Um, the uh, open space is, is looking to me a little bit better after hearing your presentation. And, and by the way, I have uh, enjoyed a number of the buildings that Mr. Hayes has done. Thank you. Um, and yet this one seems to have some some real difficulties to me still that have not been solved. And I would like to see, I'm glad to see the benches um, out front on the Emerson side. I think that's a very good move. But um, I'd like to see a, another indentation or two that, that perhaps was the place for the bicycles or the uh, spot for another place to, to sit and contemplate what's going, going by. So just to make it more welcoming and all of the buildings on that corner have a kind of diagonal feel at the corner, some relief, some space, uh, 
some plantings uh, to, to make it, and, and I'd like to see this building support that, that feel um, and perhaps repeat some of the uh, uh, pattern in, in concrete that, that you noted further down the block. Uh, it, it's just a bit austere. And those are my comments at this point. Okay. David? Yeah, I too am a, um, a believer in new and modern architecture. Uh, everything changes. I like the fact that this project has uh, a residential unit on top, and I guess that the owner wanted to um, live there, which is fine. But I have a couple of um, concerns about this that I think you could fold into historic resource issues. One, the building right opposite, the, the uh, building built in the 70s, um, was a terrible mistake from zoning. And I think that this ordinance actually grew out of that terrible um, planning decision. Uh, I guess Mike, one of my concerns about the development as proposed is that it moves the whole building right to the edge of the sidewalk, um, which I think makes the mass of the building greater, even though the architecture cleverly provides relief. It's, it still effectively feels like a three-story building on the facade. Trees will help mitigate that, but I don't think that's the best. Uh, the, the best um, architectural feel for the street. And then when I look back into the middle of the street where the Gordon Be Be Biersch building is, um, and on the other side, opposite that, uh, which is a, I guess a category three building. Uh, um, Acme. Yeah. Acme Glass. Acme. Or right. Vive. The, the, what's now the gym. The Vive, yeah. Yeah. Um, those buildings actually have height, but <clears throat> it's mitigated by the fact that the ground floor actually re recedes or re is recessed back from that plane, that second story plane. Even though the Gordon Biersch building effectively is all a glass facade, most of the time in good weather, and since that's all we ever have now, those <laughs> doors are open. And so you get the sense that it's not a huge imposing structure. How, so, is, uh, can I just, how, how, is that, how is that different than our entire ground floor being open? Well, so one of my other comments, <laughs> the next comment, open. the next comment was, gee, here's an 18 inch space that you are very proud of. And yet from the outside, you can't feel that at all. And would, what would this building look like if in fact that space was open? I think it would have a, a significantly different impact. I guess the other thing and where I'm going with this is I'm concerned that this building will encourage both the building across the street, which is now a spa, used to be a car repair place and a battery um, repair place, is going to then say, well, look, there's a big building up here on the opposite side of the corner, so we want one of our own. And suddenly that grows. And then across the street from that caddy corner, the southwestern corner, which is effectively one story, maybe that wants to be four stories. So I, the last thing I would like to see is this building encourage even further development on those levels. Now, it's a different is that zoning historic? District. It's a zoning issue, you're right. Is it, but in fact, what we're talking about is the reason this is here is there are buildings on this street in the middle of the block that have some historic value to the city. And every time we build a taller building up around them, I think that those shrink in significance and the pressure is then to pull them down. So. I'm just offering comments. That's what we're looking for. Um, I like the fact that you have the, 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 the stairwell and the entrance to the residential unit along the Emerson side, but why does that have to be blocked by a concrete wall? I don't know, you know, I'm not, I'm not an architect and I'm, um, I'm not suggesting a change, but I'm thinking, wouldn't that be really great if it was not a, a real solid barrier. I don't know, you know, is glass better? No, I'm actually thinking you could do some kind of screening so that that becomes sort of part of the sidewalk landscape, even though it is um, private. 
again, it's a real significant barrier. David, sorry if I make yeah. a comment. Sure. But, uh, I, I think should probably, some of the, the you ARB should, comments. You should probably. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, uh, David Kleinman. I'm the building owner. Yeah. Um, so some of the ARB comments were were similar, and I've given it a lot of thought. And and although I like the board form concrete, and we want some of that, I, I think this is a. I mean, to me, the best part of this design is seeing the staircase through there. It's kind of just kind of cool to see that. And I think if we open up that area and make it glass. Um, which really emulates the historic buildings to the extent that we can uh, do that. I, I really think it will be a, a very positive addition. So I think that's basically a given. Um, also to just comment on Beth's comment, um, we, we've already come to the conclusion that really emulating the, the clipped corner and maybe opening even the top, you know, in the residence, maybe having a deck or something outside to really pay tribute to the fact that it is a corner as opposed to, you know, a hard edge. And, and the other uh, two of the other three corners are, are, are angled in some way. Even the agreedly, you know, horrible building across the street has a clipped and angled corner. So I, I think we, we do want to work with that, you know. It, that building is irretrievable, architecturally speaking. Yeah. I agree. Yeah, for the record, I don't, I don't like angled corners. <laughs> Whatever. So I guess these, my comments really move to basically a massing issue. And I find this building, even though it's on the corner and it could anchor the corner, and as Martin has pointed out to me, all four corners of that Emerson Hamilton, uh, that block of, of Emerson between Hamilton and Forest have very tall buildings now. I'm not sure this is an addition. Another tall, taller building is, a, is a, an improvement, although it's shorter. And um, I think we're 32 feet to the top. Yeah. Uh, and I think that really covers it. So I guess if I was going to send something to the Architectural Review Board, it would be to um, help this building complement the historic buildings in the middle of the block uh, in a way that um, doesn't overwhelm them. I, I'm thrilled that there's a residence on the top, by the way. The parking's kind of weird. Also, why why can't we have that wall really, that that's along Emerson be three feet? I mean, you can kind of yeah. just so so anytime you can see into that space, yeah, I think was, it feels big. That was clear from the ARB is that they felt like this wall was too high. So our thoughts of trying to hide the parking um, didn't resonate with them. They'd rather have that space more more open. Whatever. Yeah. Okay, and we're so, fine with that. Yeah. yeah. Um, Thank I'll, you for those comments. You know, yeah. I, I like the materials. I like the, the I, I'm. Uh, and we are trying to draw on materials that yeah. we see right sure. there. Uh, and I think actually this is not really as much a criticism. It's not a crit meant to be a criticism. It's just observations about the size. So thank you. Thank you. Your turn, Martin. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chair Kohler. Uh, I also have um, uh, visited the site and I used to be a customer at the cleaners there. So I know the, uh, the building there. Um, I'm also concerned about the massing, and uh, I did request, and then the board received this perspective, so thanks for that. Uh, I also provided my own uh, perspective. This is, uh, and I'll pass it out. The board has already received it. I'll give it to staff and also Mr. Hayes. Um, so this view is, it's like it's in the middle of the street and above uh, eye level. Um, I'll pass what I produced, and the board has this also. Where'd my copy go? And uh, what I did is I took uh, the drawings that uh, you produced and then uh, created that view. So that's standing in front of uh, Gordon Biersch uh, looking up. And uh, the dashed line on my little perspective there indicates from what I was able to perceive from your drawings, the height. Um, and you can comment if you think that's accurate, that little dashed line up there. And I guess my uh, uh, two comments, one about uh, the, uh, um, your sheet A 3.3 talks about a, uh, a flat metal panel. Um, and my little uh, rendering that I showed there is if there, my comment to, regarding uh, review would be if, if there's maybe some kind of articulation on that instead of it being a perfectly flat, I'm looking on your A3.3. And uh, uh, we have, yeah, we have a vertical yeah. metal panel. And w so what I didn't know if, if, if that's, uh, just some, there's some texture up there versus the, the plane as I was perceiving it from from my little drawing there. 
Um, the fact is that you do have a, a there's about a, uh, there's a, there is that cork, cork oak that's been, uh, looks like it's been pretty well maintained. That's about a four story tall oak cork um, uh, tree, so that's gonna hide a lot of that massing. But from where I was standing here and then my little perspective, I think that blank wall is gonna be visible. So my comment would be if there's some kind of texture to it, so it's, you know, um, you know you're a genius about those things. Yeah, so it's not a big blank wall. That, that was my comment on that thing. And then if you look on the, the back of my little drawing, it talks about the um, uh, pattern here. And uh, so we have um, four relatively massive tall buildings on the corner of that block with hist some historic buildings infill. So if 2003, I mean, I would say 203 forest on my little drawing in the back, um, uh, I'm seeing a justification why that can be a, a massive building also, and then let all the, um, the music of the historical buildings or the um, smaller uh, detailed buildings uh, be the, the infield between those four uh, bookends, you might say. Um, those are my uh, comments uh, at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Thanks for all the comments. I've been looking at this. Uh, I also have to disclose that I had worked with the owner here, here 18 months ago on another project, um, which I never, never, I, I got, I helped him get his project going, I guess is one, one way to put it. Um, yeah, so I'm interesting as looking at all this and uh, I had a client who's, oh, I, we did this very nice home for them, and his office was in the uh, older home just down the street uh, Thoits, from there. there where the Thoits building? The what? The Thoits' building? Further, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, you know, go up the stairs and, yeah. yeah. So I went, I actually went by that, uh, the cleaners there quite a number of times, finding parking and stuff, but as I'm looking at various things, I, I, uh, I kind of look at the, um, to, um, chime on with everybody else. I think what could be really neat, and I don't know, is the I am I am concerned about the the corner being really. When you look at the um, exterior elevation of uh, well, you can go from you go from on page A three point one where it says existing, and then you go to three point three, and when you compare the two, uh, there's a, there's really no, there's not much left of the ex existing drive-through. You know, if you look at, at A3.1 on the lower right-hand corner, then to A3.3, you see the two views and um, uh, the tall wall here for the trash bins and all that, and this and the parking. The openness of that whole corner is basically not there anymore. So um, I was trying to see if there's a way to, if the upper floors could reflect the openness of the first floor with either a balcony or a roof or something, that would help open that corner a little bit. Um, I, I have to admit, I, I'm not sure the building across the street that was done by Bill Cox all those years ago was, uh, I did a lot of work with him and he, uh, uh, he was very, he liked that building. <laughs> I always thought that was Tad Cody's hmm? office. That yeah, was the, 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 oh, was it Cody? Oh, that's yeah, right. Tad Cody. Yeah, Cox built it. Okay, okay. I'm sorry. Tad I get my... Um, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting building in the fact, of, but it is very vertical. And it, across the street is you guys and you're very horizontal, except that some of the horizontalness is being, I think, lost because of the height of the building above it. Um, so, I, I mean, I guess kind of go along with what everyone else has said today. And uh, I think it potentially has a, could be a really kind of a neat building, but I'm just worried about the openness of that corner and I just really don't think a lot of people are gonna wanna stand around outside where the, the, the garage bins are, the garbage bins and cars, and, um, and it's so high you can't see people going by maybe. Uh, 
Um, and that, I think maybe opening that corner might help um, and still have the square, but maybe some of it's open. I guess you prefer not to have open corners, is that? <laughs> Listen, have preferences, uh, right. Um, okay, well, I'm, I, general, I think it's uh, an interesting project and it's, it's kind of taking advantage of an awkward zoning situation where you, you, you're not zoned for office, I guess, all the way up. And you can't get the parking and this and that, so you're using it. And I know the owner would like to have a downtown space to live. I don't know if you're, well, it doesn't matter. Um, okay, I think that's, I don't really have a whole lot more to say. And just Thank that, you, Chair I think the corner, I think with more openness of some sort would help. That, that seems to be a prevailing theme. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, yeah, just to wrap up what I initially started out with, I personally do not think it uh, has a degrading impact on the historic properties along Emerson. It's uh, like a bookend kind of, it's a massive, more massive structure, but it, it uh, obviously is different, but I don't think it degrades it, the historic character of Emerson. I don't, I'm not sure all of us, I, I don't think it degrades it. Uh, I just feel that the building itself is. Uh, well, that's, what, that's what we're being asked to, to look at, this, okay. what's the impact upon the historic properties. I will be very interested to see how it's built with the people occupying the floor below. Yeah. <laughs> How's that going to work? Two floors. <laughs> two floors. No, 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 we're adding, yeah, there are two floors there. Two floors there's 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 yeah, and it's, it's kind of, I think you'll find it interesting. We, we've found several companies, and it's getting more popular, that would build the structure off-site, almost complete, uh, and truck it uh, to the site. We'd have to close off forest for a couple of days, you know, maybe a, a weekend or something. And they, they crane the pieces into place after, you know, we'd have to obviously pour a, a, a column and, you know, a little bit of concrete. but. Um, the existing tenant should should have no interruption. So it's interesting. Yeah, I mean, we we really literally wouldn't do the project. Uh, the tenant's too too good, and we like them too much, and don't want to disturb them. But you have little... stock. You must have stock in insurance companies. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh. No, you wouldn't want to have stock. Right, right. Uh, you have one last comment, Beth. Uh, actually, uh, a couple of comments, and one is that, that I feel that it would have a very beneficial effect to leave the drive through all the way through. It would open some space. It would um, allow people a safe way of getting out. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of worried about a handicapped person or a person who's as short as I am trying to see what's coming up for us and also back out and miss the pedestrians and whatever else happens to appear. So uh, I would like to see that openness there. And um, I, I do agree with, with uh, Board Member McKenna that I feel like as presented at this moment, it it does have some degrading effect on the historic character. Oh, I'm sorry, that's not what I heard uh, Board Member McKinnon say. Yeah, I, I said I, I did not believe it had a degrading effect. Oh, you did, did not. not. I did not. I, I feel that it does. It didn't have. enhance it, but it didn't degrade it. It was just kind of neutral. <laughs> If I could just uh, give a quick comment on the idea of keeping the drive-through open. We, we originally planned to keep the drive-through open, and uh, I met Dave Doctor out at the site and explained what we were doing, and he, and he, said, uh, he said, the tree's gonna have to come down, the cork oak. And I said, well, while we're doing the project, it, you know, aren't there things we could do to the pavement or special dirt? He said, no, it's, it's, it's gonna die. And it's been dying, by the way. He's, he wanted to take it down a few years ago. 
I said, well, maybe we can save it, and he came and pruned it, and it, it's, it's kind of go, you know, coming and going. So then, um, he said the only way we could really save it is if we had a much larger area, that, um, you know, landscape area, where it could be irrigated. And I said, well, I'm, I'm open to the idea of closing off the, the drive-through. I don't, I don't, the tenant doesn't, you know, they, they're buying parking for their tenants now. They don't really want uh, their employees to park in there. Um, and so they're totally fine getting rid of all the parking, but we have to have the one handicap space. So I said to Dave, well, what if we did this? Could we save the tree? He said, oh, absolutely. If you gave me all this extra area and did this watering, you know, this, uh, you know, this irrigation and structural soil, we could keep the tree. So it kind of became a drive-through versus cork oak decision. And, and the ARB, interestingly, you know, we explain that to them. And, and I'm fine taking direction from the city on it. But I think people said, well, you know, people have been backing out of the handicapped space for basically 50 years since it's been the same situation. Um, so it's probably OK. Now all cars have backup cameras. So I think all in all, at least my personal opinion, is that it's probably still better to close it, be able to keep the cork oak, and have some people backing out. You know, there's some risk there, obviously. But they've been doing it all along because Right, it's going to be used much less frequently. So just, just something to consider. Yes, David. Um, it seems to me you could take the curb cut out uh, on that, next to that oak, and that would stop the, the auto traffic, which is what I think Dave Doctor wants to do, and then do some kind of you know, landscaping. That tree is entirely bound 360 degrees around it with hardscape. I don't know why it's alive at all. I don't know where it gets its water. Must must be have very deep roots. So anything you could do. That's what we're proposing. Yeah. The curb right. cut goes away and we can just sure. put this landscaping in. Yeah. But so if the curb cut goes away, I still think you could leave that arc arcway open. I don't think, you know, you can figure out a way to keep the cars. Oh, but it wouldn't be drive through. Yeah, right. Yeah, just yeah. so it's not drivable. That's isn't that what Dave Doctor is saying is that the dri it's the drivability across there that that jeopardizes the tree. OK, so anyway, I just want to be clear that. Yeah, great. OK. See no other comments or anybody. Thank you very much for coming. And we will do, we'll probably see another round at some point as well in the future. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. If we, do we yeah. have to come back? I, th I think um, given what that the ARB has continued to a date uncertain and the applicant has indicated that they're exploring some things, um, I think it would be uh, nice to have this appear before you um, again. And we're only a recommending board as well and on this process. Right. You know, and if it's, uh, you know, consent calendar or, or there, there may be a way to do it that, you know, you can, you can uh, pull it off if you want to discuss it, that kind of thing. Yeah. So what? you're you're coming back next week? Is that... <laughs> what, what is the time there, schedule for your project? Might be project? I don't know. Uh, what, Ken, what is the time schedule for your, your pro project? Do you have one or not? Uh, you know, it's really it's, it's really it's what really hard to put a schedule, schedule together until you get through the, the city process. Yeah. Um, we thought we'd be done by now. He so. promised <laughs> me by the weekend we'd have complete plans. Well, yeah. mm. Thank you very much. All right. Thank, thank you very, very much. much. We move on to uh, agenda item three. Summary and discussion of the city council slash HRB study session that was held on May 6, 2015. Uh, and you just thought we'd have a little confab about how it went and this and that. Did you get any feedback from um, council members, by the way? Uh, yes, thank you, Chair Kohler. Um, we have had some feedback. In fact, uh, council member Du Bois, I believe, um, has some comments that he would like to provide to the board, um, and I'll cede my time to him. Okay. I just had one quick comment. I thought the staff report was pretty good. I thought it was a great conversation. I hope you guys felt that way as well. Um, I think myself and I think several other council members said it as well, um, urging uh, the board to be a little more proactive. And I think, you know, there are a number of topics identified here, and I think um, that was the one thing that. I didn't see it called out in the staff report that I might have called out a little bit stronger was um, to actually take on some of these topics and uh, come back to council. Welcome to the mayor. Okay. 
Um, well, I thought the meeting was quite uh, enlightening in a way, and I think the uh, council, I was actually surprised of the, not surprised, but surprised of the actual interest and depth of some of the comments that council members made. And there does seem to be a fair amount of awareness and um, um, interest in seeing the historic world of Palo Alto become a little more higher on the goals list in general um, for not only the city council, but maybe the city as a whole. There are um, things that are happening fairly fast uh, um, around town. And so I think that's, uh, you know, I, I, was, I, was, I was very um, encouraged and impressed by the uh, um, comments made by um, council and the mayor and uh, who's here hi and uh, so uh, yes I wanted to make you aware that she was here so you didn't say anything that would be anyway how about you Beth and David and on a, on a public... here we have a public meeting that's being recorded in video and we would say anything other than totally laudatory things about our public um, yeah. people who basically sacrifice their lives to run our government. Yeah, that's true. Uh, actually, I would like to make a, a comment about this staff report. Um, I'd like to do all of these things. So uh, the first thing I'd like to do is figure out a way that the HRB could actually compel, might be too strong a word, but might be able to re review projects that, like this one today, have an impact on an historic area of the city. The building that immediately comes to mind, and I don't want to pick on the Hayes Group, but it's the building that's right across from the Cardinal Hotel under construction. It's right over there. It is right next to an historic district that we recognize as being very important. And we never had a word. We, and I don't know of a way we could have compelled them, them to bring that to us, but I think that, that would be a completely appropriate thing for the HRB to review. So if there is a way we can do that, wh whether it's a board member uh, asks for a project to come before the board, I'd like to know about it because I think that's one of the ways we could actually move this discussion forward about how our city, especially downtown, is being developed. I'm, um, so that's the number one thing is how can we do this and maybe the two of you could figure this out and come back to us on a subsequent meeting. I don't know there is a way. And the other thing is I'm very co uh, cognizant of not increasing the cost of these projects because they're already extraordinarily expensive. And the last thing you want to do is add another three months to a planning process. It's already more than a year long. Um, I'm wondering, uh, one of the benefits that I think we could provide as a city to encourage people right now to do historic renovation, which costs us basically nothing, is to expedite the planning process for any historic project. Just say, we're going to do this in 60 days. I'm not looking at Julie and Matt because I know how they'll feel about that, but <laughs> really, uh, you know, just cut it in half. And that would, that, you know, that's 12 months to six months. That would be an extraordinary cost incentive. So, and I don't really think that that costs us money because I think what that does is it puts all those projects up front. It just takes them right to the head of the line and says, we're gonna look at you first, even though you didn't come first. Uh, I think that would, be, that would be a pretty big incentive. And again, I don't think it costs us money. Um, I guess that's, I don't need to talk all, anymore, but um, those were my thoughts about this list, which I thought was a good list and how to move forward on it. Okay. Go ahead. I think uh, it's an appropriate time to uh, make a motion. I, I, I don't know if I really call it a motion, but I, I guess I would, that uh, we retain a historic consultant to do a survey of all the Silicon Valley industrial sites that are within the bounds of Palo Alto to get the industrial context identified. Historic properties of Fairchilds and other buildings that uh, are completely missing in our historic inventory. And that uh, I propose that we uh, would go to council and request funding 
for a historic consultant to do an appropriate survey to identify uh, historic industrial sites. I think that's, uh, I don't know how that process can get started. I guess it, it I guess we can have, an, I, I guess what I'm requesting then is to have uh, a second on my motion and have it officially approved here as a port recommendation. I'll mm -hmm. second it. Oh, okay. I'm not sure we have need to do that, but it, I guess the, there's a motion on the, on the, yeah. on the table that we uh, recommend to staff, city, whoever, um, that uh, we hire a, some sort, get some money, and get a research done on the existing historic industrial buildings. All those in favor? Uh, aye. aye. Who's opposed? No. Okay. So we made that motion and passed it. Um, right. Maybe staff has one who like to. They, they, sure, you have a right to make a comment. Thank you, Chair Kohler. Um, so as you'll see in the memorandum, um, their staff is um, recommending action on all the different items that were brought up, um, including um, the item that relates to um, the context of industrial buildings as well as the post-World War II context um, that's identified as the modern age context, as well as the next item, which would be survey update. Um, right now, staff is recommending that um, we look to next year's um, CLG grant cycle as an opportunity to apply for federal funding to do exactly what Vice Chair McKinnon has, has stated. So um, we believe staff would say that the um, recommended action item that we've proposed is actually consistent with um, the vote that was just taken. Yeah. Um, and the survey update that would um, follow a modern age context would identify those resources that are being discussed. Um, in relation to um, the other topic that was brought up um, by uh, Board Member Bauer, um, it, um, staff has heard very clearly from the council as well as the ARB on um, a number of different applications that they would like the HRB to have uh, a more frequent review role. And so I think that that is occurring. So I, I'm not sure that the board um, necessarily needs to compel um, or, or, or urge the issue along uh, other than to um, perhaps suggest to staff what types of projects specifically, um, and I think you've, you've indicated, for instance, adjacent to a historic district would be one type of project that the HRB um, would like to review. Um, and um, what staff is currently doing is um, working on developing some type of policy framework that would clarify when things um, would go to the HRB for, uh, for advice and recommendation. Okay. Beth? Uh, and for some time, uh, we've talked about that. I think Board Member McKinnon has really educated us in terms of some language at least talking about a project that is adjacent to or across the street from uh, either a historic structure or a historic district so that, that there, there's a lot of background of, of that sort of thing being an acceptable sort of limit. So I think it's one that that we've talked about a long time, it'd be nice to see some action on it. And I wanted to ask, when you talked about the modern era, uh, are you also including in that mid-century modern? Because we really have not ha had any design um, framework or thought of mid-century modern and that big looming question of what do we do about the Eichlers and that sort of thing. Uh, yes, thank you, Board Member Bundenberg. Um, one of the contexts that would be studied under a modern age context would be mid-century design. So that certainly would be one of the areas, and specifically, of course, um, Eichler as a, as a notable builder. Um, and so that would be one of the themes. Another theme, of course, would be the birthplace of Silicon Valley and the development of industrial facilities. So um, what we can actually do is um, over the next year or so prior to putting in uh, an application for funding for the actual context statement, we can work to develop um, a preliminary set of themes and contexts that should be studied in detail under that project. And so we've already 
through this conversation started that that uh, that list, if you will. Okay. Okay. I was just going to make a quick comment. Um, it's I, I, I like all the work that we've done in, in identifying um, several of the areas that may need our attention, like updating the inventory, and um, I like I'm particularly inter interested in the incentive um, in offering the Mills Act to. Uh, people who own historic residences or historic buildings. It seems like each of these um, topics is very, um, is a project within itself because they all have a depth of complications and knowledge and understanding and uh, taking time to, um, I guess, put them into, put them into play or put them into motion. Um, but how, how much of that as a board can we, um, I mean, we can identify these different topics, but how do we actually put them into reality? And I think, I guess that's when we look to staff, because they're actually doing, they're, they're really doing the work to make all these things actually become into reality. Is that correct? But it looks like um, that the HRB is to provide the council with a memorandum to summarize and respond to the topics. I guess is that some, is that an action item that we need to take a look at, and then also, should we try to prioritize because we can't really do all these things at once? I mean, maybe we need to identify which items are seem like they need uh, more attention than others. So it just seems like there's a I, I I like the fact that we've identified all these really important things. There's a lot of them, so uh, it's hard to do be effective in doing all of them at once. I think we need to prioritize. I think that's probably an item to be scheduled and planned for instead of continuing. I, I'm not ready to talk about how we do it at the end of the day. But. Yeah, no, I think today we were exhausted yeah. and we've gone through two yeah. um, items. I think, I think that's maybe our, our next meeting that we don't have uh, an applicant. We can, yeah. we can zero back in on this and, and try to focus on, on what, what we've, because I think we've made a lot of groundwork. We've made a lot of progress to get to this point. So. Just in moving forward, maybe not today, but at our next meeting. Okay. Thank you, Chair Kohler. Um, uh, my comment is about the um, uh, preservation incentives, and that's on page three and four of the uh, memorandum. Uh, and uh, there's one sentence here that says, uh, in the meantime, as recommended by Council Member Du Bois, the HRB may propose specific amendments to make existing development incentives more available to contributing properties and or to historic buildings in more existing zoning districts. Um, is that as, is, the answer is gonna be no, but is it, can it be as simple as the board just says, we can make a motion that uh, that happens or what, what's the process to uh, get uh, all buildings listed on historical inventory uh, to have available uh, the, the development incentives, um, for example, uh, you know, square footage additions and all that stuff without being in a district itself. So what's the process for an HRB to, to uh, make okay. uh, that amendment happen? So, so um, existing uh, preservation incentives are um, provided under the code. They're authorized under the code. So any um, permanent change would have to involve some type of code amendment. Um, it's, um, we can look into ways of um, doing um, some type of uh, perhaps temporary ordinance or something like that that would allow for um, other properties to make use of those existing incentives. Um, I think the, um, to answer your question, it's, I don't think it's as simple as the board making a motion and right. saying make it so. I think um, as you know, the council's indicated, the board is really being asked to work with staff on the details, the nuts and bolts of how to actually make something like that happen. So I think what we're trying to do is, at the tr we're trying to look at these at the treetop level today mm -hmm. without getting into detail on any specific one of these um, to just sort of capture the full range of activities that were discussed. Mm -hmm. And the idea I think also is to um, have the HRB or staff is recommending that the HRB loop back around and provide the council with a memo to um, indicate what their recommendations are to proceed on these. Um, and of course the council can provide additional direction to the HRB and staff as to, as to how to proceed um, on any specific area. Um, 
So I see this as, as evolving over time that we will mm -hmm. um, get further and further into the, into the details of each of these projects over time. Um, I would just mention also, staff has indicated some general parameters for when um, s these action items might be completed or started. Mm -hmm. um, they're not necessarily prioritized so much as they are um, listed in a way that, that sort of makes practical mm -hmm. sense in terms of how to accomplish each and, one, each and every one of them. Um, oh. I'm not sure that any one is more important than the other. Mm -hmm. They're simply, they all follow different paths in terms of what um, work needs to be accomplished and you know, what the available funding is and things like that. Is it useful for staff or maybe for the board to comment of, um, for example, um, yeah, oh, to get uh, all yeah. historic properties uh, available for the incentives? Is what's, is it, do we wait for staff to suggest when that be on the HRB agenda or, or, or we request that to be on the agenda soon or how's, how do we, what's the next step for getting those mm -hmm. incentives to be on all historic listed properties? If I can, um, address that, uh, we, you know, this, the city, the Department of Planning and Community Environment has, has a work program with a number of items that are on our plate um, from council direction, and we're busily trying to take care of all those. So the typical pattern would be to have a council, you know, colleagues memo or something that would direct staff to add this to their workload. Um, it would involve going uh, probably some outreach and planning commission mm -hmm. review of an ordinance, a draft ordinance, um, and then you know uh, going to the council. Of course, HRB would be pulled into that, um, as would ARB um, most likely. So I think um, it, it's just it's it's again trying to fit it into mm -hmm. the work program that we have in front of us with the various ordinances that we're juggling. Sure. Um, I, I appreciate that it's it's a identified goal mm -hmm. and um, you know the, the timing of it is what we need to work work on sure. um, yeah. but it's great to have it in this memo mm -hmm. uh, and, a, and a memo that you might prepare for council sure. and council Du Bois the uh, since um, it sounds like is this correct that the um, the work schedule and work programs at the uh, Planning Commission those come directed from the council is that correct yeah, I think think largely. I yeah. mean, but again, I think even on the PTC, they have some areas of interest that they're, you know, starting some projects that they want to bring to yeah. council. Yeah. You guys have had some good conversations about the Mills Act, and you know, my comment here was largely I think you you guys could have some discussions about what kind of parameters would make sense yeah. in Palo Alto. You know, rather than just talking broadly about the Mills Act, are there some specifics you could start to get yeah. to? Yeah. So for council to make um, a, a, a recommended uh, work program for the planning department, would that then, would the council then, I mean, would it make sense for an HRB to provide a, a draft memorandum for council's review and then the council decides if that language then gets transferred to, what's, what's the path? Yeah, I think that the, would make a lot of you're talking about sense. proactive HRB I think, stuff. I think, Martin, you're just, yeah, yeah, doing something like that suggests to get to something in their hands and then they yeah. can decide. Right. Okay. Does that need to be a formal public hearing process, or can that just be a direct HRB uh, City Council uh, uh, communication, or does that need to be in a public arena to discuss a, a suggested uh, direction for Council to send to planning? I mean, I'll let these guys respond, but I think you guys could craft a letter or a memo and send it to Council. Yeah. Okay. Does that need to be a publicly endorsed HRB, or can that be individual HRB members that go directly well, to a council? Well, if it represents member? HRB, I think it needs to be public, come yeah. from the okay. HRB. Okay. All right. Be better if it was public. Okay. Yeah. So that could be a suggested uh, HRB agenda item to uh, yes. craft a letter that's, to suggest. That's what. Okay. That's what I was trying to say. Excellent. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, I, I want right. to. I want to make one comment about uh, the packets of information we're receiving. I just became aware I never got item number three here in my packet, and that Beth, and I had to make a copy of my item number one for Beth yesterday because she didn't receive item number one. So somehow these packets are, are not being adequately screened for material. Thank you for letting us know. We will yeah. definitely look into that and make yeah. sure that all the board members receive all the, all the materials yeah. um, in the future. Thank you. Yeah, so that's two cases right there. Okay, I have one last item. Uh, my neighbor is Bo Crane. He is, grew up here in Palo Alto, 
played football for Palo Alto High School, went to Stanford, had one year of football, and decided he wasn't going to get crunched. But anyway, he's a um, longtime historian, and he has written a book, and uh, it's going to be available out here. It's, and I'll just read what he says. Hi, he says, hi. The t Life and Times of Dennis Martin will be available in early June. Dennis Martin was an early pioneer who owned a ranch adjacent to the Sand Hill Road on, Winnie, on the Winnie Accelerator side at the base of Jasper Ridge. Arriving in the Bay Area in 1845, Martin bought his property and began his ranch while California was still part of Mexico. Struck, he struck pay dirt in the world in the gold rush and then began his sawmill business with California part of the United States. However, his fortune tumbles and he did, uh, he did go broke in San Francisco, uh, and broke in San Francisco in 1890. The point is, he's gets a book. I'm gonna have gonna be copies of this. It's gonna be a book uh, and it's uh, a book that combines the history of Dennis Martin as well as uh, uh, related stories of early California and thinks he's done a lot of research on this. And he's um, so I'll hand these out for uh, everybody to to know about. Pass that down, and I got some for you guys as well. Anything else? We have a meeting coming up. After Chair Kohler, this? just just one housekeeping item. I believe we're still technically on on um, agenda item three. Um, would the board like to continue that item to the next uh, meeting? Continue the item to the next. So I think we just need a, a motion and a vote on that. I move to uh, continue item number three to the next board meeting. I second. All in favor. Third. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Okay. Um, I've lost my menu here, so. Uh, uh, Chair Kohler, can I ask staff a question? Yes. Since I think we're now into um, board staff announcements updates, Matt had sent out a list of seminars that were coming up a um, month and a half ago maybe. And one of them was quite interesting to me because I need to get to one before September. And I th think I sent you back an email saying I'd like to attend this. Is there any funding for us or should we just do this individually? So if you're referring to the CLG training workshop that I think all the, all the board members and staff are, are actually required to attend on an annual basis. Um, yeah. The actual registration hasn't opened up for that yet. Okay. And so I think that's what we're waiting for. Um, so as soon as that's opened up, we plan on registering everyone that, um, that is available to attend. Right. Um, and I believe that's in Capitola. That will be in Capitola. Right. And do you, I can't remember the date, but. Um, I believe it was August or September, I think. Right. That's yeah. right. So I think it's August because. Yeah. Because I think there's another one in September in Sacramento. Yeah, right. so but the Capitola one was very appealing because it was close. Yes. Yes. Capitola. And right. you can go surfing yeah. while you're there. Okay, well, so if you're tracking that, that's uh, great. And we'll, we'll follow up. rely on you to stay up to 21st. 21st of September. Oh, August 21st. Okay, anything else on the agendas or anything? I think that we've one? had a good meeting and a long time here, so uh, I declare the meeting adjourned. Who's going to have to